25. In fact, at the end of verse 24. And I want to say that uh, I'm thankful to be here. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. I want you to know that as I say that, uh, I know that I am inadequate. That my words and my mind, my life... but I want to tell you about my Lord. I want to tell you about Jesus. In John chapter 19, and we do this at our church, and if you'll just do this for me, in honor of God's word, the public reading of scripture, if you will, please stand. And I ask you to stand simply to say, we believe that this is God's word, and we're asking God to speak to us. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved, the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his, his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones were broken, will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. That last sentence that I read, they will look on him whom they have pierced. For a few minutes this afternoon, I want to look on him. I want to look to the one that they have pierced. We have heard in our conference so far that our eyes are upon you. When you don't know what to do, oh Lord, our eyes are upon you. We as pastors must be sure that when we talk to people that we point them to the only one that can do them good. And that is Jesus Christ. The one whom they pierced. Look to him. Now you're familiar with what's going on here. In John chapter 19, everything is pointing to this point, the moment of the crucifixion. You know that the death of Jesus Christ is by far the most important event in human history. The cross is the focal point of our Christian faith, and our highest and best thoughts are rooted there. There is no greater mystery. There is nothing that inspires more wonder than the crucifixion of our Lord. Because when we look at the cross, we see... God's mercy at its greatest and the depth of our sin at the deepest. This afternoon, I want you to look on him whom they have pierced. John has been writing with one purpose in mind. In John chapter 20, he tells us that he is writing that we might believe. When we talk about what it means to believe, we have to be sure that we understand, even as pastors, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Because in our day, it seems to be just any kind of intellectual assent, any kind of affirmation, any kind of sincerity somehow 
hey, that person believes. What does it mean to believe? To believe is to continually embrace the person of Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord, and treasure of one's life. To continually embrace the person of Jesus Christ as Savior, Lord, and treasure of one's life. Now, what does that mean? Well, we embrace him as Savior because we realize that we are great sinners. We embrace him as Lord because we know that he is God. And we embrace him as treasure because we know only he satisfies. There are people all around and people in your congregation that are desperately looking for something. My dear brother, point them to the one that was pierced. Cause them to look there. We live in a broken world. It is easy for us to say Jesus is the answer, and he is, but if we don't explain it, and if we don't apply the gospel, then our people miss everything. It is incumbent upon us when we stand before our people and we open up God's word that we are sure that we are communicating not our thoughts, not pop psychology, but what God's word says. This is the gospel. It is at the cross that we find hope. It is at the cross that we find help. It is at the cross that we find everything we need. Now you know, and you have probably preached sermons on this, that as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he utters what we call the seven sayings. The seven sayings from the cross. John records three of them, and we will look at them quickly. But remember what crucifixion is. I know that uh, in the last few years, it uh, has seemed popular to talk about uh, all the terrible physical things that happen when one is crucified. We know the Mel Gibson movie a few years ago really stunned people and offended people at how gruesome crucifixion really was. And yes, it was a horrible death. The Romans devised this in a way that it would send a message. They wanted people, when they saw somebody crucified, they wanted them to be warned. They wanted them to be afraid, be very afraid. That's why they would crucify somebody at a crossroad, a busy place. We know that Jesus was taking, taken outside the wall of Jerusalem. He is crucified at the place of the skull, Calvary, Golgotha. Uh, it's a killing field. It is a place where people go to die. Pilate had written that this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, he had that place on the cross. And remember, the Jewish leaders say, don't put that there. Just say that he said that he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, no, I have said what I have said. I have written what I have written. And I believe that God's hand was behind that because Jesus really was a king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, one we really don't understand, one that we can't comprehend but he is all that we need. Will you look at the one that they have pierced? We live in this broken world. We say that we have the answer. We know that the Bible says that God created man in his own image. What does that mean? Usually we begin to talk about emotion and we begin to talk about volition. And all that, I think, is a part of it. But a few years ago, I was in a bookstore and I enjoyed reading. I know all pastors do. And I saw a title of a book, and I thought, that's interesting. And uh, I picked it up. It was by Christian George, Timothy's son. And it was called Sex, Sushi, and Salvation. And I thought, all right, that's uh, three winners to me. I'll pick it up. <laughs> and let me tell you, in that book, one of the things that Christian George says, and this is not exact, but this is what I take away from it, but it was really good. He said that part of the understanding of what it means to be created in God's image is simply this. That inside every human being, there is a desire for community, for intimacy, and for eternity. Because when you look at the triune God, Father, Son, Spirit, co-eternal, co-existent of the same stuff, that in the Godhead, there has always been community, Father, Son, Spirit. There has been intimacy, perfect intimacy, to know and to be fully known. And of course, we know that God is eternal. And inside of everybody is this uh, image of God. 
And that is why people will go anywhere to look for community. They will go anywhere and do almost anything to have a sense of intimacy, even if it's a one-night stand followed by a walk of shame afterwards. And when it comes to eternity, they will make up religions and they will make up things that somehow give them a little bit of peace at night because there might be something out there. My dear brothers, we know who that is. It is the one whom they pierced. We must tell people to look to him. Now, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he says three things, according to John. And very quickly, I want to talk about these three things. I know there's a clock somewhere. Where is it, guys? I'll just use my watch. It's 3.30 by my watch. Just joking, y'all. Uh, let me talk about the three things. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, and as he has been hanging there, and we know that he hangs there for uh, six hours, at one point, he looks down, and he sees his mother. Look at this first section. And this is, if you're taking notes, this is the point I'm trying to make. Because of the cross, because of the one who was pierced, you can write this, Jesus transforms our relationships. Jesus transforms our relationships. Notice what happens in verses 25, 26, 27. Jesus looks down and he sees his mother. She's with three other women. We don't know a great deal about Mary, but when you put it all together, Mary is probably late 40s, 50, 51. She was very young when Jesus was born. And now Jesus is 33. He is the firstborn son. We know that Mary and Joseph had other children. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 lists uh, four brothers by name that Jesus had. And he also talks about sisters so that we know that uh, Mary and Joseph uh, uh, had other children. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. We know that at some point Joseph apparently died because he is no longer in the picture. He's not seen after the time that Jesus is in the, in the temple at age 12. And as the firstborn... Jesus is to take care of his mother. And as he is looking down, he sees on her face the agony and the pain. What was it like for her to see her firstborn crucified? I can only imagine that she is thinking about his birth and how she held him, how she nursed him, how she saw him grow and develop, how he grew to be the man, how he became this rabbi. But even more than that, she is remembering all the circumstances around his birth and how he has been different than everybody else. She remembers how the angel showed up when she was 13 or 14 and said, you are going to have a baby. And she knew that she had never had sex with a man. We know that story. We know that when Jesus was born, how the angel showed up and how the message was peace on earth. Wow. And she's thinking about all these things, but now she looks at her son and says, is this Messiah? I know that my son is Messiah. Is, is this the way it ends up? She is confused and she is devastated. So Jesus looks down from the cross and he tells Mary that John will take care of her and tells John that Mary will be like a mother to him. Why not the brothers and the sisters? Well, we know that in John 7, we're told that his brothers had rejected him as Messiah. We know that the uh, resurrection changes their mind. But what I want you to see is the love that Jesus has for his mother. He is about the business of saving the world, but he is not too busy to care for his mother. We know that Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. He is keeping the fifth commandment. To honor your father and your mother. He is honoring her, taking care of her. When he says woman, and by the way, there's no place in the Bible where Jesus ever calls Mary mother. But when he says woman, it is respectful. It is not a term of disrespect. But he is not speaking to her as her son, but as her king. She must remember that he was a heavenly son and she an earthly mother. Mary is in need of forgiveness. 
Even when you read the Magnificat, where she finds out that she is going to bear this Messiah, she sings about salvation, her salvation. Mary is a sinner, and she now takes her place at the foot of the cross with the rest of the sinners. He was dying for her sins as well. But the point I really want you to see here is that Jesus transforms relationships. All of a sudden, it's John, take care of my mom, Mary, mother, woman. I want you to know that he is going to take care of you. And at the cross, all of our relationships are rearranged. All of our loyalties are realigned. And this is where it gets exciting. Do you understand that when Jesus Christ died, one of the things that was taking place is he is creating a new family. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, if you recall that, he says, Paul does, that a new race of people, that God has created one man. He says that there is something that happens when people become believers. There is a unity. There is something that we have in common that we never had before. And there is a new race of people. Do you realize that believers are a new race of people? It's a wonderful thing to think about. Because when Jesus comes, he does not Christianize the Jews nor Judaize the Gentiles. He says this is something brand new. This is the church. Do you realize that we are part of a new family? That guy that's sitting by you as a believer, that's your brother. That lady sitting by you is your sister. And we have brothers and sisters throughout churches in America and throughout churches in the whole world. And we need to begin to think and teach our people to think in terms of new relationships, new loyalties, new responsibilities. Because the cross changes everything, and the cross transforms relationships. See, in America, in our culture, we have uh, individualized our faith. We talk about Jesus died for me. And and we are so individualized, we put the uh, buds in our iPod, and we listen to our own set of music. We will download our own movies. It's all about us and our tastes and our likes. And yes, you can say rightfully, as a believer, Jesus died for me, but I want to encourage you to begin to think in terms and get your people to think in terms of Jesus died for us, that we belong to Christ and we belong to each other. You know, John 13, 35, Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. If people look at my church, when people look at your church, can they say there's something different about those people? Do we understand that we are God's new people, that there is an allegiance that Christians are to have to one another that is greater than the allegiance that we have to our own race, our own gender, our own nationality, our own demographic, our own age group, and even our own biological families? It's interesting, you recall one time Jesus' family come to get him and, and the people tell him there's a big crowd and they say, your mother and your brother, they're standing outside, they're desiring to see you. Luke 8 says, but he answered them, my mother and my brother are those who hear the word of God and do it. We are his brother, mother, sister. See, Jesus isn't slamming his family. He is exalting obedience. His family consists of those and only of those who hear his word and do it. It's not that we earn our salvation, but we give evidence that we are adopted into his family when we hear the word of God and do it. It's already been said by every speaker, and I want to echo it. Alabama pastors, we're family. That radically alters the way we do things. We love one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. We are not to compete with one another. We're to speak in honoring ways about one another and to one another. We do not gossip about one another. We rally to the side of those that are hurting. If the only thing we can do is cry with them. In fact, sometimes that's the best thing to do. We will rejoice with those who rejoice. Guys, have you ever had something good happen in your ministry, in your church, and there's nobody that you can really tell it to because you 
Either they'll think that you're prideful or you're in competition or you're tooting your own horn. You need guys. I have about three or four guys that are about as sorry as they are. Day is long and most of them are here. And I, I, they will rejoice with me. And if I get puffed up, they'll poop, pop me. You got to have that. We are in this together. What happens in your church affects my church. What happens in my church affects your church. When we look at the one who was pierced, we need to know that all relationships have been changed. When we disagree, and we will disagree, we can do that agreeably. We will pray for one another. See, when John comes back to the cross, and I say back to the cross, really back to Jesus, he was one of the disciples that fled. But when he comes back, he finds grace. Jesus on the cross, there's not an eight saying, go, oh, John, why did you leave? No. He comes back and he finds grace and he finds responsibility. I think he responds joyfully, sacrificially. He doesn't say, Jesus, how about your brothers and sisters? Can't they do this? He doesn't say, what is this going to cost me? He takes Mary to his home. He says, Mary, you are now in my family. You are now in my world. The cross changes everything. Your people know that. Do they experience that? Do they hear that from you? Do they see that in you? If we're created in the image of God, and we are, and if part of that includes the idea of community, and I think it does, then what Jesus did at the cross says, we are community. When everybody is looking for a club, a ball team, colors to wear, something, some gang, think about it. Everybody wants to be a part of something, identified with some group. And all of that is just an emptiness, a shadow that points to what really matters, the family of God. Look to the one who was pierced. Because when you do, you will find out everything changes. Well... Point number two, as we look at the sayings from the cross, Jesus satisfies our deepest longings. Jesus satisfies our deepest longings. Look at verses 28 and 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Over and over in John, and especially in this narrative about the crucifixion, John reminds us that these things are happening according to Scripture. The death of Jesus Christ is not an accident. The death of Jesus Christ was planned before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ was not a victim. He was not somebody that got caught up in some political machine and somehow or another got rolled over as some people think it was just his bad luck. Oh no, Jesus says that this has been planned and over and over again, as Jesus' life, and especially in his death, he is fulfilling the scriptures, the prophecy. Psalm twenty-two, fifteen. 15. Psalm 22, by the way, is the most quoted uh, Old Testament uh, chapter in the Bible. That is where he says, the tongue, I know in the ESV, sticks to the jaws of my mouth. Your Bible may say, sticks to the roof of my mouth. Even the idea of the drinking of the, the uh, sour wine, that's prophesied in Psalm 69. Well, why all this reference to prophecy? Because John wants everybody to know, including us, who the Messiah is. Make no mistake about it. The biggest details, the smallest details, Jesus fulfills them all. You don't have to look anywhere else. But why does Jesus say, I thirst? Well, first of all, he's human. He's been on the cross for six hours it's hot he has been tortured he has had uh, the loss of fluids and uh, of his blood he has been beaten beyond recognition in order to breathe he must push up on that nail in his feet and catch a breath and you know that gravity is really what kills somebody that's hanging on a cross because it constricts their lungs and they cannot breathe anymore and they will eventually die that's why breaking the legs hastens death but as Jesus is hanging on the cross, and every time he pushes up to catch his breath, it just makes him more thirsty. And now his throat is burning, his lips are cracked, his tongue is thick, his vocal cords are swollen. He has a raging thirst. 
But is that all that's going on here? Is it only a physical thirst? I think he's talking about something deeper, much deeper. Why do I say that? Well, as I said, he had been slapped, spit on, beaten, whipped, nailed to a cross. But he never complained. He never said, oh, that hurts. Don't do that. No, that's why I think when he calls out, I thirst, he is talking about something deeper than physical thirst. I think about Psalm 42 too, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. What a wonderful picture of the deepest longings of a person's life and soul. The emptiness and the need of a person's life characterized by thirst. Jesus used that illustration over and over. The woman at the well, you've preached on that. How she is sitting there, or Jesus is sitting there, and, and she comes in the middle of the day because of her background, and she's had five husbands, and the guy she's shacking up with now is not her husband. And remember the conversation, they start talking about worship, but it's something more than that. And then finally Jesus says, I have living water. And she says, tell me more about that. And, and Jesus is telling her that we can never, never satisfy our thirst with the things of this world. Let me tell you, there are people in our churches and perhaps even in this room who are trying to satisfy that deepest longing in their lives with money, our sex, our power, our pleasure, prestige. It may be a house. It may be getting married. It may be having children. It may be being known. It may be some recognition. It may be that degree you're working on. But do you understand that you can drink and drink and drink of those things and your thirst, your soul thirst will not be quenched. You have a profound thirst in your soul. The Bible, I think, clearly teaches what we thirst for most and need at the center of our lives is not stuff, but God. And without him, people die of this thirst. Oh, the agony of an unquenchable thirst. When we try to fill our lives with everything but him, we only grow more thirsty. I think about the rich man in hell when he cries out, send Lazarus and let him take a little drop of water and put it on my tongue. Oh, we can talk about the fires of hell, and yes, I believe they're real, but I think there's something else there. It is that unquenchable thirst that people try to fill their lives with everything else and hell will be that thirst will never find satisfaction. Jesus had a thirst. You know what it was? It was to glorify God. Everything he does, I bring glory to the Father. Everything he does, I want to do the Father's will. His passion, his desire, his delight, his satisfaction was always in the Father. He was never distracted from that. But on the cross, bearing our sin and shame, an amazing thing happens. The one who created the oceans, the one who created the streams, the one who had perfect fellowship with God, that soul thirst absolutely satisfied, cries out, I thirst. Jesus became thirsty so you could be filled. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, I think that he is saying something to the effect, I am thirsty with a thirst that every sinner deserves to experience forever. He experienced the curse of thirst in order that we might be fully quenched by him as he pours out his Holy Spirit in us. He was thirsty. He was parched so that you might drink of the spring of eternal life. You need to be mindful that the people that you pastor are looking for something, for someone. They're looking somewhere to quench this thirst. They need to be told, they need to be reminded, they need to be shown, they need to be lovingly demonstrated that only God will do that. Because anything other than that is an idol. Look to the one that they pierced. You, O oh Lord, are the only one that can satisfy my deepest need. Jesus said, if any man thirst, any woman, any boy, any girl, let him come to me. Drink deeply of this spiritual living water. Do you realize that God offers infinite delight in himself? That is what it's all about. I said, if we are created in the image of God, and we are, and part of it is the desire for intimacy. You think about how many people have false intimacy. 
Why is pornography such a problem? It's not only a physical thing. It's this idea that I've got to connect with someone somehow, somewhere. I want people to know me and I want to be known. I want that soul thirst satisfied and only God satisfies. And I want to tell you, my brother or sister, there are too many churches, too many pastors who have committed the sin that they did in Jeremiah's time. And Jeremiah 2, when he says, Be appalled, O heavens, at their... Excuse me. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. Here is a sin that appalls heaven. Here is a sin that makes the angels say, It can't be. Here it is. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Think about what was going on in Israel. <laughs> they worshiped demons. They had temple prostitutes. There was sexual immorality. There was infant sacrifice. And God says, let me tell you why. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Oh, they know that he's there, but they deliberately act like he does not exist. He is the spring of living water, the source of life, where true pleasure and only where true pleasure comes from. There are people who will get up on Sunday morning, and they may even open a Bible, but they don't point people to Jesus. Oh, they'll tell you three ways to have a happy marriage and five ways to handle your finances and seven ways to be a good neighbor. And I want you to know that you can have great finances, you can have a wonderful marriage, you can be a good neighbor, and you will bust hell wide open because only Jesus Christ satisfies. Are we telling our people that? Are we giving them the living water? They've hewn out cisterns. I used to think that was the opposite of brethren when I came from Prattville, but anyway, it's, a, it's simply a, a well that people would dig to collect water, and he says, it's cracked. It's dried up. What an incredible picture. The idea that people are in this dried up well and they're picking up that sand that may have just perhaps a little moisture in it and they're cramming it in their throats and they're trying to suck something out of it and only to find out it doesn't satisfy. I'm telling you, there are people around us who don't understand that the living water is found in Jesus Christ. God offers infinite delight in himself. And what we do is we get at the bottom of that broken cistern and we suck the filth. We get that water out of the mud and dirt hoping to find something that will bring satisfaction. There's only delight in God. Only God quenches our thirst because we were created for him. And my dear pastor friend, I want to encourage you to drink of that living water yourself. Mention has already been made about our study habits, and I want to encourage you to study not to prepare sermons, but to know and enjoy God. I want to encourage you to know the truth and rejoice in the glory and the grace of God, that you might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And when you preach, let it be an overflow of God speaking to you that your thirst has been quenched not that you're perfect, because I'm certainly not. And maybe you have been one who has tried to drink out of all these different wells, and you can speak from experience, I have found that only Jesus satisfies. What are you feeding your people? And when they come, are they hearing God or just you? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, a concert audience does not come to watch a conductor, but to hear the music. A church congregation should not come to watch or hear the preacher, but listen to the word of God. When people leave your church, they better not be thinking, man, that choir was good. They better not walk out going, oh, that guy's a great communicator, or he is so funny, or so deep, or so whatever. 
Oh, let him walk out going, Jesus is incredible. Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is all I want. Jesus is all I need. The most important thing about you is your concept of God. I said that earlier in our Q&A time. Everything in your life flows from who you think God is. And if you don't have a big vision of God, if you're not drinking at the well of his glory day in and day out, you miss everything. And so will your people. The third saying is simply this. As you look to the one who was pierced, Jesus completely paid for our redemption. Jesus completely paid for our redemption. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. It's his human spirit. He died. Now, he's been on the cross six hours. His body is quivering. His chest is heaving. He pushes up and he says, it is finished. He does not say, I am finished. This is not a cry of tragedy. It is a cry of victory. I know that every pastor has preached on this, this one word, to telestai. This one word that Jesus utters means to fully accomplish something. Something that is absolutely complete. It is done. If you had a bill and you paid it off, you've used this illustration, you could write to telestai on it, paid in full. I have good news, my friend. The work of redemption is complete. Christ's atoning work is finished. Redemption of all those who will believe has now been accomplished. It is finished. The suffering is finished. The prophecies are fulfilled. God's law has been kept. The price of sin has been paid in full. Full atonement has been made. God's justice has been satisfied. The ransom has been given. It is finished. Wow. This is in the perfect tense, something that happened in the past and it will remain forever finished. Why is this a big deal? Because this is the good news of the gospel. It is through the person and the work of Jesus Christ that God fully accomplishes salvation for us, rescuing us from judgment for sin into fellowship with him and then restores the creation in which we can enjoy our new life together with him forever. Is that the way you understand the gospel? It goes from beginning to end. It starts with creation. He creates all things. It's perfect. Sin enters the world. After creation, that fall is real. It has affected all of us. And every part of us has been touched by sin. There is a promise, even in Revelation, I mean in Genesis 3, that a Savior, a Messiah is coming. One that's going to undo everything. And that is what happens on the cross. Everything in the Old Testament is foreshadowing that Jesus is coming. Every sacrifice, every day of atonement, every Passover, everything is pointing to Jesus. And Jesus comes and fulfills it all. And he says, it's done. That's it. There's nothing that you can do. Christianity is all about what Christ has done for us. It has been a divine rescue. It's not what we do for him. It is not self-salvation. It is not steps to victory the gospel is first about divine accomplishment not human attainment it is not about principles for living what we do as christians is always as a response to the finished work that jesus has accomplished for us and if we don't preach this way if we don't let our people know that jesus paid it all we'll sing it but we don't preach it we don't allow it to get into our hearts and minds because what happens is our people come week after week and if you give people a steady diet of six ways to do this and eight ways to do that and nine ways to do this and four ways to do this but it's nothing about jesus nothing about the finished work of christ on the cross i tell you in about a year they got about 500 things that they're trying to do and instead of freeing them you have enslaved them that is why the uh the bad the the pinata guy his first book was uh your best life now what was the second book anybody remember uh good or still that's not it but it's basically it if you have your best life now why in the world do you have to write another book because you got to keep working at it and that's kind of the message that we communicate to our people Oh, but let me tell you, when you understand what grace is and you understand what God has done, then all of a sudden, 
This desire for eternity that has been built into you, you begin to understand that it's given to you by God. You will be with God forever. He is with you now. And you don't work for salvation. You work from it. It is a freeing thing. Because the people that suffer from inferiority in their Christian life and they think I've done something so bad that even the cross doesn't pay for it. Slap them upside the head. Are you telling me that you're so bad that the death of Jesus Christ doesn't cover your sin? Oh, yes, it does. Then be set free, my sister. Find out what it is to live for him and love him and enjoy him. How many times have you heard somebody preach a sermon where basically it's, you know, you got to pay God back for something. He did this for me and now I'm going to do this for him. What? What do you think that does? You will kill yourself trying to pay God back and never make a difference. Do you think God wants you to pay him back? No. He died that you would love him, that you would know him. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's what redemption is about. I am telling you, it is the most wonderful, joyful, freeing thing to tell people the good news of Jesus. You cannot add anything to the cross. When you add something to the cross, then you are no longer a Christian. You've missed everything. And that's your mindset. Remember what Paul says when he talks about that you have fallen from grace? It's not that you're saved and now you're lost. It's here is grace and here is works. And if you decide that all of a sudden it's the cross plus being a good person, it's cross plus baptism, it's cross plus anything, then you have fallen from grace. You've been pulled away from grace and you have a religion that is trying to ascend to God instead of the good news of the gospel that God has descended to us. He is the one that was on the cross. It's God in the flesh who has paid for our sin. We have an incredible God. I want you to be free. I want you to be free in your preaching. And I'll go ahead and tell you, when you begin preaching like this, the baby Christians are going to squeal because you've changed their formula. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, once they begin to drink this, and as mentioned earlier, they begin to feed their souls with the meat of God's word, they will be changed. And they will realize that everything you do involves glorifying God. Can you be a lawyer to the glory of God, a doctor? Can you be a waiter, a waitress? Can you wash cars to the glory of God? Can you install kitchen equipment? I've just named people in our church that have shared with me how much the gospel has changed their life because now everything is under the glory of God. Oh, you tell your people, quit this, quit this, quit this. Do you realize that sin is not a bunch of things you don't do or even that you do? It's when you see the glory of God and you want to drink of what he has offered and you know that that's all that matters, you will get rid of everything that dims your view of Jesus Christ because you want him more than anything else. I'm telling you, it will change you, it will change your life, it will change your church because this is the gospel. I'm telling you, pray for me and I'll pray for you. Pray for me and I'll pray for you that we would speak the truth of God's word, that we will be guarded from error, that God will give us insight, that he will use us to edify our churches in such a way that we could say like Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I am looking to the one who was pierced. Can we pray together? Oh God, when we look at your word and we see how wonderful you are, we are overwhelmed, we are filled. As believers, we want to say, oh Lord, let us continue to know you, love you, enjoy you. And Lord, we pray for one another that we will experience family as brothers, that we will encourage one another. Lord, we're thankful that you have created a new family because of the cross. Lord, we're thankful that you are the one that satisfies our deepest longings.